Good afternoon. Uh, we have Arana Tobst, who is going to talk about massively parallel processing with procedural Python. He works for Pivotal. Pivotal. Uh, Pivotal. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, we, we have some links up for this talk. So there's an IPython notebook that has all of the code examples we will be looking at today. And it's also on NB Viewer. And uh, I will post my slides on speaker deck later on so you can um, have a look at those. Uh, quickly about Pivotal. So we were founded in 2013 out of parts of VMware, EMC, and Greenplum. Uh, we have three core components, which is agile development, uh, platform as a service, and big data. Uh, I myself, I work for Pivotal Data Labs. I'm a data scientist, and we do agile data science engagements. We also have Pivotal Labs, which do agile application development. And we have, uh, at the core of our company is Cloud Foundry, which is a leading open source platform as a service. And it, uh, we aspire to be the Linux of the cloud there. And that, uh, that is showing some real encouraging growth. We also have a very competitive big data suite. Uh, we have a Hadoop distribution, Pivotal HD. We have a massively parallel processing database. We're actually the market leader there. It's called Greenplum. And we have an in-memory database called Gemfire. OK. so. Uh, what, do, what, do, what does a typical customer of us look like during a data science engagement? Well, usually there are very large enterprises that work with terabytes or petabytes of data, but they're not really making use of that data to its fullest potential. So uh, oftentimes they have old legacy systems uh, with very slow response times of the, of the queries. It may take hours and, and uh, to get a to get any sort of uh, insights on these, uh, on these data sets, and that is no way to do agile data science. Or, or, they, or they're stuck with old legacy BI systems where they can only deal with data that they can load into memory. So what we do is we transform these enterprises into data-driven enterprises. But um, we also lead, support, and um, contribute to many open source projects. So. Um, some of the more popular ones uh, you will definitely recognize here is Redis. Uh, we, lead, we lead Redis, we lead Spring, we do RabbitMQ, Grails, Groovy, Cloud Foundry, as I've already mentioned. Uh, we, do, we, we contribute a lot to Hadoop. Uh, one library that is at, at, at the center here, it's called Madlib. That is our um, in-database scalable machine learning library. And I will talk about, uh, about that more later. We also have a couple of more smaller open source projects. Uh, one of particular interest to you guys would be PyMadlib, which is a Python wrapper for our machine li learning library Madlib. We'll also have a look at that later. And during a typical data science engagement, we work with uh, Greenplum or our, our Hadoop distribution, Pivotal HD. So you may ask, where, where does Python come into all of this? We do a lot of exploratory data analysis, like the rest of you in IPython Notebook, using Pandas, Matpl Matplotlib, and all the other great libraries out there. But uh, we've already heard a lot about this. What I want to talk to, to about today is PLPython, Procedural Python which enables you to run Python functions inside of your database or inside of your SQL on Hadoop engine. And um, with that, you're, you're able to use uh, great libraries like NLTK and scikit-learn within your database. And that is a very powerful concept, as I will show. So on to PLPython itself. Um, the, the, the basic idea of PLPython is to reduce data movement to a minimum. You want to bring the code to the data and not <clears throat> the data to the code. So what a lot of people do, they connect to a database and then they load the data into memory. And if the data set is big, it will, first of all, it incurs a lot of network traffic. And uh, secondly, it might not even fit into, into main memory. So what we try to do is we push the code onto the database or onto our SQL and Hadoop engine 
where it then where we then do the machine learning right in the database. So I'm going to show you how to do this. So um, a user-defined function in an SQL database, it's, it's just essentially a query you can pass arguments to. And the syntax of these uh, PL Python functions, they're essentially just uh, as, as normal Python functions we have in here with a SQL wrapper. So the SQL wrapper up there, we have to, um, we have to pass uh, the types of the arguments since SQL is a strongly typed language. But other than that, it's exactly the same as we would do in, in a normal Python function definition. Down here, it says uh, we, have to, we have to state the language of we're using. It says PL Python U. You may wonder what the U stands for. It stands for untrusted. PL Python is an untrusted language uh, in databases at the moment, and that is because uh, with Python, as you know, you can um, call arbitrary system commands, and that is obviously a little bit of a nightmare to, to system administrators, but uh, sadly, that is just the way it is at the moment. Um, the function itself needs to include a return or yield statement. And um, let's have a look at some live code at the IPython notebook. So I hope this, this works fine. Is the, is the font big enough for the people in the back? Good, good stuff. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so what I'm doing here, I am loading the, the SQL extension here which was written by Catherine Devlin. You can, you can download that. It's, it's completely free. And uh, all I'm doing here is connecting to a local instance of a Greenplum database I have running on my machine. And then we can define a function here. So uh, this is just our PyMax function we've seen before. It just finds the maximum of two integers here and uh, you, can, you can define this and then it does what you expect here. You call these functions just, uh, you can call them in a select statement, so select pi max of two or five and of course five is the bigger number, we can also change it here and it will execute just fine and we get 11 as expected. So back to our presentation. If we, <clears throat> so if we want to return uh, multiple results, we can do this by uh, creating a composite type. And this is done with the create type statement. So in this case, we um, create a named, uh, a named value. It's just a tuple of a name and a value. And we do this here in the create type. And what we can then do within our Python code, we can just return a tuple we can return a dict or a list, and then the database knows how to put those into individual rows. If we actually want to return multiple rows, then we can uh, use this set off notation up here. We, we say create function make pair return set off named value, and what it does then, it, it, uh, <clears throat> it fills multiple rows in your database in addition to multiple columns. We can also uh, use generator statements within our um, PL Python functions. And, um, but what is really of most interest to us data scientists is that we can access uh, packages such as NumPy, SciPy, scikit-learn, and so on from within the database. So to do this, you have to ensure that uh, the packages are installed on all of your database nodes or uh, Hadoop nodes or whatever it may be. And once that is done, you can just use import, uh, for example here, import NumPy just as you always do. So let's have a look at some more code in the IPython notebook. So what we do, what I did here is uh, I created a, a composite type that we've just seen, a named value. And what we can then do is uh, we can create a function name pair. In this case, it just emits the tuple again. And then we can call this function and it works just as expected here. So uh, what is different than to ordinary uh, Python though is that a SQL allows for multiple function definitions with the same name. Just the function signature has to be different. So in this case here we have, we just pass a name without the value. 
and, but the function has the same name, make pair. And what we do here is we import NumPy this time and uh, create a value programmatically. But we can, if we define this function, it just, it runs just fine, it's done. And we can use this function here and uh, SQL will know uh, how to pick the function by uh, the number of arguments you provide to it. So if I change the argument here, I go and put Horatio 11 and I execute this again, it will, it will execute the function we have defined up here, the function where you pass a name and a value to this function. Huh? So <clears throat> what we've done up till now was that we called the function from within the select statement. And yet, as you may have noticed, what it returns is a, is a tuple and not multiple columns, what we normally want to do in SQL. So uh, the way you can return multiple columns is, is that you do not call the PL SQL function from the select statement, but instead from the from statement. Then your database knows how to put uh, the returned values into multiple columns. And this is what happens here. All right, and if we want to return uh, multiple rows and multiple columns, we have to re uh, use the set of notation I mentioned earlier. And what happens then? We can define this function. And uh, what we do in, in the loop here is we uh, loop over multiple uh, name uh, value tuples. And if we execute this, it returns then here uh, multiple rows and multiple columns. So to understand the next section, uh, since this talk is called Massively Parallel Data Processing with Python, I have to quickly introduce uh, what a massively parallel architecture is in the first place. It can either be an MPP database or it may be Hadoop. So in the, in the case of Greenplum, you can think of Greenplum as multiple Postgres servers working together. They're coordinated by a master node, and uh, there are a lot of worker nodes that all work in parallel. But to the user, it just looks like an ordinary Postgres database, except a lot of engineering effort has gone <clears throat> into it to make it seamlessly execute the query in, query in parallel. So the master node, it remembers where all the data is stored and it sends the right parts of the query to the right nodes and the nodes will send the data back to the master and uh, we have a much, much more scalable database. And uh, Greenplum is actually a fork of Postgres, so you get all the Postgres goodies such as PostGIS and all the other great extensions in Postgres. So uh, how does this relate to PL Python, you may ask? Well, what we've done before is uh, we just called the function on all of our data. Now, if it's stored in a cluster, maybe a Hadoop cluster or, or MPP database such as Greenplum, then we'll incur a lot of data traffic because all of the nodes, they have to send the data into the function uh, on one particular node that then does the computation and it's going to be slow and horrible and uh, big disaster. So how do we get around this? Well, um, we have to think about parallelization within the database. So what I've done here is I've created some example data. It's just uh, three series. We have one, one variable that is just a categorical variable here, uh, the letter A, B, or C, and then um, a series X and a series Y. And both of these series, uh, they're, they're three million observations long. It's just some, some example data. And now we define a function npmean that uses numpy to find the mean of, a, of an array. And um, like I've mentioned, we, we, have to define the, we have to define the function, uh, we have to define the argument type since, since uh, SQL is strongly typed. But other than that here, we can just import numpy and we can call npmean of the value array and it will return the mean. So uh, to do this, to, to pass an array into NumPy, we need to use the Postgres function array aggregate. What, what that simply does is it takes a column of data and it uh, transforms it into an array and then passes it, passes it into a function. 
So uh, once we do this and we execute it, we get the mean of the, of the Y column here and it's all good. But the problem is uh, this doesn't execute in parallel. So, th so this just executes on one node and uh, we, we get a lot of traffic and a, and a long runtime in a distributed system. So how may we parallelize it? In this uh, toy example here, we had these uh, different names here. So, so all the series were uh, in categories. So what we can actually do when we call this mean function, we can now group by the name column. And what the system then does, it intelligently parallelizes over, over the data. So there's, there's no more data movement and actually the, the uh, query executes in parallel. And uh, let's have a look at a more interesting example. So, <clears throat> so what we do here is uh, we, we define a function called lin, re lin regression. It's just linear regression. We pass an X array and a Y array into the, into the function. And then inside of the function, we import stats from SciPy and we just use the lin regression function. Huh? And uh, we can define this function here and it should just run fine, yes. And then we can execute it again as we've already seen. But the problem again is this does not run in parallel and it's not infinitely scalable. So uh, how do we solve this? The same way as we've done with the mean we group by name and then, then it uh, simply estimates three models in parallel and we get the model coefficient, we get the p-values and so on. But the problem with this approach is you may need a global model. So not all problems can be uh, <clears throat> boiled down to, to some sub-models. We have a lot of cases where that we can do that. For example, if a customer gives us sales data for all of Germany, then we can fit sub-models for each state and it usually works just fine. But in a lot of cases, uh, we need a global model. So how do we do this? Uh, first of all, before we get to the global models, let's just recap um, some of the benefits of using PL Python. First of all, we can bring the code to the data and not vice versa, what, what usually happens. And especially in corporate environments, uh, databases is usually uh, where the data lives. And when SQL, when our, when our SQL falls short, we can leverage our Python experience to, to do basically whatever we want to within the database. And we can, we, we've actually done this in real projects. We've applied the pi data stack to petabytes of data, which is not easily done, uh, of course, on a, on a single machine. And um, <clears throat> what is often overlooked too is that the results, they're already inside of the database. So um, you don't, usually you want these results in the database. So when you have an app, the, the app can query this model or these results and you, you have them ready for further analysis and storage. So you don't send data out of the database, process it, and then send the results back into the database. It all happens within the database. So what I've just mentioned earlier was, what if we want to fit a global model? And uh, this is not easy, easily achieved with something like procedural Python. Well, we have Madlib for this. I've mentioned uh, this uh, at the beginning. It's, it's our open source, uh, open source scalable in database machine learning library. And uh, what it does, it's a collection of algorithms that are specifically designed to leverage a cluster architecture to, to fit um, global models in parallel, but using all of the memory of the full cluster. And uh, Madlib was initiated in 2010 by um, uh, some, some researchers at UC Berkeley and um, at, at Greenplum. And the idea was to collect, collect a lot of uh, in-database algorithms these people uh, had been using all along. So Madlib is actually quite a mature project now. We have a lot of algorithms, uh, both uh, unsupervised and supervised learning algorithms. 
We have k-means clustering, we have elastic net regression, we have decision trees, we have random forests, we have latent Dirichlet allocation, we have things like um, conditional random fields. So it's actually a lot of a lot of uh, algorithms in there, and you can it's it's completely free. It's open source. Uh, besides on Greenplum and our SQL on Hadoop engine uh, Hawk, it also runs within Postgres. Of course, if you run it in Postgres, you do not get the parallelization, but you do get the benefit uh, that you can fit models that do not fit into memory, and you also uh, get the benefit that your data does not have to move out of the database. So how does MATLAB actually uh, work? Um, the, the very low level matrix routines, they're all uh, C++ uh, with well-known libraries such as Boost. But the driver functions, it's actually all Python code with some templated SQL. So if you download the project, you, you, can, you can have a look at this and, and uh, it's, it's fairly understandable. And uh, this is another place where, where we use a lot of Python. Um, now let's have a look at some uh, real, real world examples of how we use uh, Python, especially PL Python, during our data science engagements. So one of my colleagues in San Francisco from our healthcare vertical, uh, Ailey Crow, she uh, is a biomedical uh, PhD, and she, she recently she completed some pioneering work in in-database image processing using PL Python. So uh, what we see up here on the right, this is actually an uh, image of some uh, cancerous breast tissue. And um, what she did is she read uh, these, uh, many, many of these images into a database in the following format. It's actually quite simple. And you just, on the, on the very leftmost column, you just have the name of the image. Then you store the row and the column of a given pixel. And the last three, last three columns, they're the intensity values of the red, green, and blue spectrum. So it's actually quite an intuitive and simple way of storing images in a, in a structured format in, inside of your database. And in this way, and we are able to circumvent many of the traditional challenges of image processing. So usually, if you get a huge image, say, from a satellite or also, in this case, medical images, they're often so large, it's difficult to process them in memory. And especially, you get thousands and even millions of these images. Uh, putting them in a database and processing them in, in parallel really does make a lot of sense. There's also other use cases, such as... Uh, detecting malfunctions, for example, uh, in manufacturing. Um, so how does this look like? Well, there's, there's actually a lot of steps in, in counting and detecting these uh, cancerous tumor, uh, these cancerous cells in the, in the breast tissue. But uh, the first step of this is uh, smoothing. Uh, this happens a lot of time in, in image processing. So, uh, what she's done here is she's just defined a function here called smooth, and she uses the uniform filter from SciPy to, to apply uh, uh, the smoother to, to the image. And then uh, up there in the select statement, she just calls this Python function uh, to smooth the image. So this would be something that would be really difficult to implement in, in pure SQL. And we can really leverage our, our Python experience here to, to get these things done, and it's, it's uh, actually quite, quite cool. Um, another example is uh, social media analysis. So another colleague of mine in the, in the US, Srivatsan Ramajunam, he has created a very, very nice pipeline for uh, processing uh, the Twitter Decker house, which is actually 10% of the total Twitter feed. Uh, that's approximately 55 million tweets per day. And we've used Spring XD to ingest this data in, into HDFS. And um, then we use nightly cron jobs to parse this data into, into our SQL on Hadoop engine, Hawk, but uh, you, can, you can use uh, other frameworks too. And we've used PL Python to parse this raw JSON data and load it, load it into the database. 
uh, what we've done then is uh, to to uh, to run some machine learning algorithms and generate some insight on this data. We uh, again we use Madlib and we run a latent Dirichlet allocation on a, on a given set of tweets, and then we are able to find a, a set of topics for these tweets. So so LDA is an unsupervised learning method that is able out of a corpus of text to find some common topics. Another method we used is uh, unsupervised sentiment analysis, and we've actually used uh, PL Python for this again because it's an easily parallelizable method. And what we've done is we assign a sentiment score to every single tweet by uh, looking at phrases and uh, seeing whether they're positive or negative. And then uh, you can enter a query of your liking and see how the sentiment for that query trends over time. And, um, and we, we built a very nice uh, web front and with this uh, in cooperation with our application development team, Pivotal Labs. Um, sadly, I was going to show you a live demo of this, but uh, my VPN seems to be down, but I've loaded the page earlier today. So uh, this, is, this is the interface. We can enter a search term here. Uh, by the way, uh, for this demo, this is all, uh, all tweets from 2013. Uh, it's, it's not our live system. Uh, July 2013, in fact, and we can enter a search term such as Obamacare here. This was a very, very hot topic in the US in 2013. I cannot execute this now because I'm, I'm not on the VPN, but I've actually, I've uh, loaded this page earlier, so uh, we can have a look at the results. The rendering is a bit off now because the resolution changed due to the uh, projection here, but you can get a sense of what this does. Um, we can see the number of tweets as they trend over time. And we also get to see here uh, the sentiment mapping we did in PL Python I talked about earlier. So this is all for Obamacare again. And we can see the green line here is the number of positive tweets. We have the red line, this is the number of negative tweets. And the gray line is the number of neutral tweets. And you can ho hover over this and you see the number of tweets and so on. And here on the right, we see the, the top 20 negative tweets uh, during that time. And uh, we can see the, the sentiment mapping is actually quite accurate here. It says uh, the latest victim of Obamacare, so this is surely quite negative. We get uh, here another major hurdle in fight against Obamacare. So this is working quite well. We can also click on the, on the uh, top 20 positive posts. And this is all quite dynamic. We get here a heat map with the, with the number of tweets uh, by time of day and weekday. So it looks like that here uh, on Thursday uh, was a good time to tweet about Obamacare. Um, and uh, we, we also get some word clouds down here. We, we have some topic clusters we can look at. And, and so on. These, these are also quite interesting. So this is, this is the uh, result from the Latin Dirichlet allocation we, we ran earlier. And uh, yeah, we can hover over those and, and have a look at the, at the tweets here. So this was quite a negative cluster here. It, it says, uh, uh, blame it on Obamacare and so on. You, you weren't, weren't using that disposal income anyway. So yeah, we, we can have a, a sort of a drill down look on this and we can also uh, click on these and have a, well, it doesn't load now since I'm not uh, connected live to the VPN, but uh, well, yeah. Okay, so um, back to the slides. Uh, another cool demo we did using PL Python was uh, did a colleague of mine, Ian Houston in London. He actually held uh, this talk uh, at PyData London uh, earlier this year, and he built a demo predicting the duration of traffic incidents in London. He did this with open data that is available from uh, the Transport of London. It's the, it's the local traffic authority in London. And he pulled in that data using PL Python into the Greenplum database. He also pulled in data from Weather Underground. And then since the, the, there was quite a lot of data, this data munging could not happen in memory. So what we did here, we, we did a lot of deduplication, feature creation, data munging within the database. And uh, then we use scikit-learn 
to fit a model to predict the duration of any given incident. And uh, we built a nice uh, web front end for this, and which is actually hosted on Cloud Foundry, our, our platform as a service. And uh, actually, our, our Pivotal Labs team is currently building a mobile app out of that. So, so there will be an Android app available for, for this at some stage. And uh, this, this, is not, this demo is not affected by my VPN. So I can actually show this to you. Let's reload this page. It should work, yes. So uh, here we see a table of all the current traffic incidents in London, which is very few. Usually there's like 30, 30 something traffic incidents in London. And we can hover over this and it will give us here a little comment. So, so there's a burst water main and this incident here has already been uh, lasting for 33 hours and the uh, predicted time remaining uh, from our model is 14.1 hours. We also get a nice map of all these traffic incidents here. Uh, we can we can also zoom out. We can click on these, and we can see the predicted time remaining of of these traffic incidents. So there's also some analysis uh, available here with some nice D3 charts. We can see the the number of traffic incidents over time here. We can hover over those. And what we also see here is the number of the average number of incidents by weekday and time of day. And the red line here is Sunday, so uh, as we saw uh, just now, there's very few traffic incidents uh, on Sundays usually. Uh, and what was also quite visible here is the two peaks here during rush hour on, on weekdays. And um, yeah, there's, there's also some other uh, distributions here, and, and we can look at a few more stats to, to compare this. We, we built these demos just sort of to, to uh, demonstrate our stack and, and do some interesting data science projects because uh, client projects, we usually can't show these to, to, to the public, uh, these results. And yeah, um, feel free to get in touch. Uh, I hope you had a very nice PyData conference and I'm going to tweet my slides on speaker deck uh, later so you can get all these links. And uh, I hope you still have a good time in Berlin. And uh, I think we have a time for a little bit of a Q and A. Thank you for the very interesting uh, talk and very interesting use cases as well. So we have time for questions. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, I think it's a very interesting approach to bring the computation uh, into the database. Um, so my question is, um, whenever you do uh, data processing uh, in a distributed database, the efficiency of your operations always heavily depend on how you've partitioned your data. That's correct, yes. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, if, you, if you do a group by operation like you, we did earlier here, uh, we group by name. So if we go back to the IPython notebook here, what we did, for example, we executed this uh, linear regression and it grouped by name. What we should do earlier if we, if we create the data is, um, is also to distribute the, the data by name. So, so uh, the, for example, the, the data from this uh, A series we, we had up here, it's uh, on the same, on the same, here we generated this A series, it's, it's actually on the same cluster node. So there's no data movement. So you have to think a little bit about this in, in, in advance. So uh, actually I've done this here, I forget to, forgot to mention it. The data is actually distributed by name here, so, so we, we did the right thing. And uh, well, yeah, you have to you have to think about this in advance. Besides distributing the data, there's also uh, you can also partition the data. So this is, for example, uh, if you have time series data, this is usually a good idea. For example, if you if you have uh, if there was dates here now too, and we would want to fit submodels for say every year or something like this, we could partition by year, and then the database would align all the data on disk for a, a given year uh, <clears throat> so that so the diskette does not need to, to keep rereading that data and uh, then it runs a lot faster. 
so yeah, you, you do have to put a, a little bit of thought into that. Thanks, That's what, that was a good question. Yeah? Yeah, over here. Uh, yes, I have two questions. Uh, first question is on the both uh, data pipeline architecture that you showed. In one you were using Hawk primarily and in, in the other one you, uh, you are using Greenplum. Yeah. Uh, can I still uh, not use Greenplum or Hawk and take the advantage of the already existing Hadoop ecosystem components like Hive or Impala that I have and still use Madlib uh, along with that? So uh, Madlib is actually available for Impala. Um, uh, so you can use you can use uh, that was Impala for Hive. There is currently no port, and uh, yeah, for for the time being, that's it for the Hadoop support. So you can use either Impala or or Hawk. That's right. And the second question is the example that you showed for traffic uh, incidents. Yeah. Uh, uh, it looked like a bit of real time analysis that is happening as the incidents are happening. You are probably uh, charting them along. Yeah. And so how near uh, near real time it is because uh, when you introduce something like MapReduce jobs, we are expecting uh, high latency of updates in data. Uh, so how do you take care of that? So uh, in fact, this is this, the, the whole feed is, is happening every five minutes uh, of, uh, of the just uh, the, the tra traffic of London feed is coming in every five minutes. So in fact, it's not like a super real time feed. And we just have a batch job running, I think, every 10 minutes that updates the app. So, so the data is fairly recent, but it's not like real-time streaming data, although uh, uh, we have uh, Gemfire that can handle that if, if, if we had streaming data. Uh, what was the name that you just mentioned? Gemfire. Gemfire. This is, this is our in-memory database that is able to, to handle streaming data. Is it open source as well? Uh, no, no. This, okay. this particular product is actually not open source. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hey. Um, is the training of models using Madlib distributed over the nodes as well? Uh, yeah, that, that is distributed over all the nodes. Uh, we actually, we, uh, our, our Madlib team has actually put a lot of engineering effort into that and a lot of thought because, uh, of course, uh, as a lot of you may know, it's not, it's not trivial to parallelize uh, all of these machine learning algorithms. And, um, it's it's not 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 simple at all. So, uh, but all of the algorithms in Madlib they make use of your full cluster and all of your compute power, and they try to minimize data movement as much as possible. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question of my own. Uh, since there have been some questions about which one is open source and which one is uh, proprietary, could you maybe uh, use one of your examples, slide twenty three or twenty five, and point out which are open source completely in so, the stack? So there is a community edition for all of our products. So if you just wanted to try this out or whatever, you can do it indefinitely and, and, um, and just play around with it. And, and our Hadoop distribution, you can also just download the image. Uh, you can deploy it on a small cluster and, and uh, that is fine. Uh, Greenplum is is not open source, uh, but you can also download the community edition of that. Um, Madlib is completely open source, so so we have a bunch of developers uh, in Palo Alto who work on this full time, and it's completely free of charge, and then there is no license licensees involved, and you can, as I, as I mentioned, you can use that on Postgres and uh, also on some other systems. All the tools on here, uh, they are they're free. Um, and uh, for our data stack, well, well, Gemfire is, is closed source, but you can also download the image of that. Does that answer your question or? Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right, thanks. So there's another question there? Uh, yeah, hi, I had hi. a question about the, uh, you said you did, they, you did um, sentiment analysis on the tweets. Yeah. Uh, you said you did unsupervised sentiment analysis. I was just interested in how you got the the like positive negative sentiment words. So um, in that case, yeah. So there is a is a um, a library called NLP Arc Tweet. It's by by some American university. I I forget. And um, what they do is uh, they actually had a bunch of humans label instances of tweets and instances of words. Uh, I think it was actually on, on Mechanical Turk and they had uh, for each tweet they had three people label it to get more accuracy because humans 
don't always label it accurately either. And they use that, that for semi-supervised learning to get a sentiment score. And it's an open source library. And I, I can also post a link to that later on. And, and we leverage that library to get a sentiment score for those tweets. OK, Thanks. thank you. Any further questions? OK, so uh, I think it's a great idea of Pivotal to make so much of their work and so much of their research effort open source and open to the public for use. So yeah, so that's a great thing and very much in line with what Travis was speaking about today. So uh, yeah, this is the end of the session and this is the end of the regular conference uh, talks. So let's thank uh, Ronald and all our speakers as well. <laughs>